From Minneapolis, Minnesota, welcome to Playwright Center's Theater Begins Here. Today, theater begins with young audiences, but first, a membership highlight. We're excited to announce that our winter and spring education offerings are up on the website. Whether you are a Playwright Center member or have yet to join, all of our classes and seminars are open for enrollment to writers and theater makers at all experience levels. For more information, check out our website link in the bio. And now, on to the show. We are so excited to have Idris Goodwin here with us today. Idris Goodwin is a multi-award winning storyteller of stage, audio, screen, and page. Currently serving as Artistic Director of Seattle Children's Theater, Idris writes, directs, programs, and or produces relevant content for intergenerational audiences. Goodwin is the author of over 60 dynamic and diverse original plays, such as How We Got On, Hype Man, A Breakbeat Play, The Boy Who Kissed the Sky, and the groundbreaking free play open source scripts for an anti-racist tomorrow. Committed to access and impact, Goodwin's work is widely produced across the country by professional, community, and academic institutions alike. His storytelling prowess extends to creating original content for Nickelodeon, HBO Deaf Poetry, Wandery, and more. His first picture book, Your House is Not Just a House, is forthcoming on Clarion Harper Collins 2024. Prior to Seattle, Goodwin served as executive director of the Colorado Springs Fine Arts Center at Colorado College and Stage One Family Theater in Louisville, Kentucky. As board president of Theater for Young Audiences USA, Goodwin champions the essential role of the performing arts in society. Welcome, Idris. So yeah, we're going to jump right in and just get started. How did you get into theater? How did I get into theater? That's a very good question. Before I answer that question, though, I do want to tell my favorite story about the Playwright Center and, and certainly how I met the Playwright Center, which uh, one, one, you know, I've been creative my whole life, but there's different starting points. And a major starting point for me was when I first heard that this place called the Playwright Center existed. So first off, shout out uh, Alan Burks, who I used to always see at the acoustic open mic in Chicago. I used to go to the acoustic open mic because I, I had started writing uh, spoken word poetry at the time. I'd only been rapping before that, and I wanted to try spoken word poetry uh, and so I was too shy and too new and too green to try to go to the spoken word poetry spot. So I picked the acoustic music joint on Mondays because then I'd be the only poet uh, in, a, in a room full of musicians, which I was kind of used to. So Alan Burks used to kick it uh, at that spot all the time. And one time I'll sit with him at the bar as we were known to do. And he was everyone was excited that night because Alan got a Jerome. Alan got a Jerome. I'm like, Jerome from uh, who, who be playing with Morris Day and them. And they were like, no, nah, no, nah, not Jerome. But he, it, Jerome is from Minneapolis. And it turned and he told me all about he's like, yeah, I'm going to Minneapolis. Uh, I got some money and I'm going to live there and just be a playwright and I'm going to get this money. And I, I like smacked him in the face. And I said, well, how are you going to tell me them lies at the open mic? Uh, no, he he told me all about it. And I was blown away by this because at that point I sort of dibbled and dabbled in playwriting in Chicago, but I didn't know anything. I didn't know how people made money. I didn't know what resources were out there. So fast forward, my crew and I, we brought a show to the Minnesota Fringe Festival uh, and while I was there, I was like, y'all, excuse me, I have to go hand deliver my script over to the Playwright Center so I can get me one of them Jeromes I've been hearing about. And, uh, and I'm like, <laughs> you know, and this is before Uber. So like, I, you know, I, I, I dipped dally, I ran through the alley, uh, the whole nine, and then finally found it, walked in there like a schmo and was like, hello, my name is Idris Goodwin. I am a playwright from Chicago. Here is my manila envelope containing my script. Uh, I expect to be hearing from you soon. You know what I mean? Uh, needless to say, I did not get uh, the drone that year, but uh, it was it was a turning point for me. This was like probably 05, 06, something like that. And, uh, and you know, a few I would then leave Chicago, go on this different journey, go to University of Iowa, write a play called How We Got On and sort of learn about a, a different phase of my of my career. So uh, I, I, I share that story. That's the first story that comes to mind uh, to this question of uh, about writing plays and beginnings. 
That's amazing. I love that Playwright Center was there in the beginning for you, even before the beginning. Just just the idea of it. I mean, I think that every, um, I think all creatives are looking for their clubhouse. They're, they're looking for their fortress of solitude. They're looking for, or no, not a fortress of solitude. That's depressing. They already live in a fortress of solitude. They're looking for um, that mansion where all the X-Men hang out. You know what I'm saying? You're looking for like, you know, I mean, and for, and for a lot of us, that's the theater, right? But um, as someone who didn't come up, you know, I love that movie Theater Camp, but that was not my experience at all. It was more basketball camp. Uh, and I didn't know that I actually would, should have been a theater camp. But uh, uh, just this idea and this history and, you know, just learning more about August. The more I was educating myself about how playwrights live and that there still are living playwrights and they're not all you know, English. I thought in order to be a playwright, you had to be English and dead for over 200 years. <laughs> so yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a big deal. And I sort of shifted. It was one of those moments as I tell students this all the time. It's like, you're going to have many intersections, you know, uh, or it's not intersections. Sorry. You're going to have many exit ramps that you can take on this journey called trying to be a professional writer. Uh, and to me, it's just about, you know, going faster, you know, just not, not taking those ramps and just being like, well, let's see, let's see what happens when we go a little further. Let's make it. Let's make it to the next one. Uh, to me, that's what it's about. And so that was like one of those big pivotal changing moments for me, um, because I had to really learn how to write plays. Because I didn't, you know, I had, to, I had to learn. I had to get new techniques and new tactics and figure out, okay, what will it take for me to get uh, that young Jerome, which you know, a new the new AD at the time, uh, a young whippersnapper up and comer named Jeremy Cohen. I remember called me and told me I had wanted Jerome, and I said. I can't accept. I got to move now. I got to go be a professor at Colorado College. But that's a story for another day. That feels like a story for this podcast. By another day, I mean in the next 15 minutes. (laughs) (laughs) So how did you decide then? So it was this Jerome, this idea of the Playwright Center and a Jerome Fellowship that was like, oh, I should be a playwright? Or or what was it for you that was like, because I know you're, you're, you write yeah. In many genres, you're you also, you know, are, are a breakbeat artist and a singer and all of these things. So yeah, so how 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 did you come to playwriting? So I I uh, I had always been looking for um, a community. Um, my beginnings as a writer was you know, I mean, it kind of just feels like always to be honest with you. Uh, in that adolescent teen period, I was writing a lot. I was drawing more than I was illustrating more. I thought I was going to be a comic book artist. I got into filmmaking, um, but had an affinity for writing lyrics because I was such a a hardcore hip hop fan at at the time when it was all new. You know, when I was 11 going on 12 in 1988, when you get, you know, Spike Lee is making Do the Right Thing and Living Colors coming and, and Michael Jordan and Mike Tyson and and uh, all these rap albums. There's now a podcast just about the year 1988. So, you know, my play, How We Got On, is about 1988. So I'm 11, 12, and I'm starting to ask those questions, but there's this new way to express myself, right? But I'm all alone. I'm in the suburbs of, of Detroit, Michigan. Detroit at the time was more, it was super into techno. It was like a lot of club music. It didn't really, the hip hop was real spread out. So I came to Chicago uh, to go to film school because you couldn't major in hip hop. And I started hanging out with all these actors, um, you know, because we were doing shooting student films and stuff. And that was before digital, the digital era. So, like, to shoot a film, you were shooting film. And film, you you know, to make a three-minute short film would cost you, like, a million dollars, right? And um, and there was very little room for error, right? Um, so you would, you would ask for a lot of favors. And so I used to run with a lot of actors, and I would go see their plays. And... Um, and there was such a more of a sense of community amongst the theater folks, um, just because, you know, film is like, you know, I'm going to, you know, there's a little bit of, you you know, I'll shoot this, I'll shoot that. I'll add, you know, it, you're alone. You're, you know, if you're a writer director, you, you're alone when you write it, you're alone when you, you know, all of that. And then you start to bring more people to the party, but then you shift into editing and then you shift into like taking it around, getting people. So you're alone. You, you, you have, you see people along the way, but you have to really, Um, throw the football and then catch it in the end zone, right? So theater to me represented, and similarly, I I started doing live music as well. So both of those represented 
collaboration and, co and, and community in a way that felt more like sports, you know, because I couldn't, I, I was not, uh, you might look at me and be like, oh my God, that guy clearly is a star athlete. He is, he is, he is easily starting straight to varsity <laughs> with this guy. Not the case, not the case. Uh, didn't, didn't have the reflexes <laughs> for it. Um, but a lot of my mentality and my, and the way I approach things is very much informed uh, by that. And so the, the, the sort of liveness, the right now, this, we train, we train, we train, we train, we train, we practice, you know, and then game day, the gods, the fates will decide, you know, and I guess quote, in this, in this analogy of game day, the audience is the quote unquote other team, though I, I, I don't look at it in an oppositional way, like meaning that's why boxers hug after they beat the crap out of each other for 13 rounds is because it's like, we're both here to put on a show. So we're, I'm supposed to beat the crap out of you, but we got to also put on a good show here too. So that is, um, that is the analogy uh, that I use. As Hannah said, you write in all different kinds of genres, uh, but today we're talking about theater for young audiences. So what led you to wanting to write for youth? The short answer is uh, I am the father of two boys and I want them to think I'm cool. So uh, <laughs> I have a son who just entered middle school and I'm now like, huh, we should do some things for middle schoolers, right? Um, uh, and I was writing, you know, pretty much, I, I remember when he was born, that's when I was working on my two first sort of younger audience plays. One was And In This Corner, Cassius Clay for Stage One Family Theater in Louisville, Kentucky. And the other was uh, This Is Modern Art, uh, co-written with Kevin Koval for Steppenwolf for Young Adults. And uh, and so I remember, I remember, I just remember getting up extremely early before he did so I could bang out pages. And I was working on the Ali play and I felt like Ali up early, running in the cold. Anyway, um, <laughs> Uh, and that when I went to the openings of both those shows, the the energy of, you know, I'm used to like regional theater. You know, I started with storefront theater. And so it's like these are like people my age and older who are, you know, uh, a little rough around the edges, so to speak. And then I move into regional theater and everyone's um, my parents age or older and very subdued when they see, the, you know, you might get a. Oh, right. Uh, you know, and when I, meanwhile, I'm at the, you know, I'm at open mic night or I'm doing hip hop and it's, you know, everyone's going crazy and it's loud and it's late. So for me, the feeling of, you know, it's 10 o'clock, it's 1030, it's 11 and it's 300 kids from four different public schools, many who are seeing a show for the first time ever. And when Corky Baker, the, the neighborhood bully who used to terrorize uh, young Muhammad Ali and his friends, you know, when he comes lumbering onto the stage, the kids hiss at him. And when they, when, when uh, he says threatening stuff and a young Muhammad Ali quips back at him, they laugh extra loud because they're on his side, you know, the way, so for a writer who's writing time-based art, thinking about hoping for an audience to react because I'm coming from the call and response nature of hip hop, and the black church and stand up comedy, the way that kids react, they're just great scene partners. They're great play partners, but great. They just teach you about your right, your play in the story that you're trying to tell the characters you're trying to create. Um, you know, they're honest kids. Don't, they don't, you know, they're with it. They're either with it or they're not with it, but there's no in between, <laughs> you know, they're with it or they're not with it. And then and when they read to go, they read to go. So if you get them, if you sustain them, it, it to me, it's a great, it's a great honor. So just that I was drawn to the energy. I also like, I don't, I don't, I, uh, I also like doing things in the daytime. So I also like TYA hours as well. <laughs> uh, but also too, man, it's like, this is, this is not to me some radical thing. This is the, this is, this is a return to the folk traditions. This is what cultures have done forever. Everybody is there and you consider everybody. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And but you also don't worry about it either. If this is a story that must be told. I mean, listen, yo, like I, I grew up in the black Baptist church in Detroit, Michigan. I was not I'm hearing about people's brothers beating them up and robbing them, a brother killing his brother. I'm hearing about, you know what I'm saying, virgin births and like, you know what I'm saying? Like I'm hearing about all immaculate conceptions and, and pillaging and pillars of salt and all that stuff, right? 
as a child. So like, those are stories, right? Those are stories. I'm young. My frontal lobe is not fully developed, but I, you, 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 you know, these are just our stories. These are things we deem sacred and necessary. So uh, I have a very um, anthropological maybe view of it. Um, and, uh, and to me also, most of the audiences that we're serving are in cities, mix of public, private, and charter, which means that we have the diverse, most diverse audiences. I mean, that's not hyperbole. So like, you know, um, what else really is there to say in my, you know, for me, for me, it just seems like obvious. Mm. And to me, for me as a writer, I've been writing my whole life. Um, I've had no greater purpose, I think, or clarity on what I'm supposed to be doing uh, that, you know, than I have once I started to get into TYA. So that leads me to my next question, which is, you know, you write TYA plays, um, but you're also the artistic director of a children's theater and you are Allegedly, the yes, of the board of TYA. <laughs> so my Wikipedia says you, today. <laughs> you've dedicated yourself to this, um, you know, in, in a very deep way. And mm-hmm. I would love to hear you tell us a little bit why, you know, this genre of playwriting is so important. Yeah. So I think it, it's, it is, um, I just think it's a real privilege to be able to tell stories to people of all ages, really. For me, I, I consider it, it's just, it's theater for all, you know, and there's levels to it, right? Obviously, some things veer this way, some things veer that way. I get it. Um, but not every household is the same. Not everybody's culture is the same or what they consider to be appropriate or not is the same. So I don't spend too waste too much time thinking about that. Uh, for me, it's just about I like how do I get stories to people, to communities, to youth in their communities, and whether people have kids or, or they don't, that doesn't matter. Children, like youth, are around, right? We're all responsible for them, whether we want to be or don't. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So for me, it's about youth and communities. Youth in their communities is what we've been saying a lot lately. And I don't know, just for me, it, it just, you know, I'm, I'm, maybe it's my hip hop upbringing. Maybe it's my, you know, Black Baptist Church in Detroit, Michigan upbringing. I just feel like all the block parties I went to as a kid, I just I just feel like, I don't know, just it just seems natural to me to that bring everybody, bring little John John, bring the twins, bring Big Mama, bring, you know, Uncle Jeff, you know, they got wheelchair access, you know what I mean? So there's something for everybody. Right. Or at least we'll aspire to, you know, Um, that just feels I'm from the Midwest, man. I'm not a coastal dude. Like I'm on the West Coast now, but I come from a very like very I come from, you know, middle of the country. Very, very like who who all going to be there, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know. So and as a storyteller, why, why I want the most people. I want the most people. You feel me to hear this story. So not every single story I do you know, veers that way, but increasingly more and more of all of them are, I've, I've sort of just, and I think it's because I live with little people that I'm just like, everybody's watching, everybody's listening. So make sure if you got something to say, and this, it can have some edge to it. It can have some realness to it. It could have some tragedy to it, but you know, make sure it's what you really want to say. Mm-hmm. I'm going to take you to a time machine. <laughs> Oh, I we're love gonna those. we're gonna go back to you starting to write your first TYA play. Okay, what was that experience like? What sparked that idea, and what is that experience kind of jumping into something that you haven't stepped foot into before? So you know, this is where we get, I think, a little bit into as a writer being aware of or a choice you have to make which is like, am I writing for the tiny theater in my head or am I writing for the theater that commissioned me? Mm. TYA, a lot of these TYA companies, the, you know, the, the, the objective is impact. The objective is numbers. A lot of, lot of uh, field trips, groups. Um, They're on buses. They got a set amount of time. They got to get on and off them buses. So it's, you're truncating your story a bit. You're keeping it tight. Can you say it in 60? You know, some go over. You know, Seattle Children's Theater has certainly produced uh, in the past two-act joints, longer things. Me personally, 
75, 80 minutes. You can do any play. Every play should either be 75, 80 minutes or three and a half hours. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, we either epic or we not. Like, are we epic or are we not epic? Because if we're not epic, don't come to just 220. Like, you're just trying to sell drinks. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to buy them drinks anyway. You you know, give me give me the extra 50 minutes to just have them drinks. Anyway. Um, <laughs> um, so... You know, that that was the early days of writing TY. It was mostly just about thinking about time, you know, time. Also thinking about clarity of story, clarity of, let me back up, clarity, I think of, um, no, I, I meant what I said, clarity of story, which is like ensuring that there's not a lot of indulgences, that we're moving this thing along in a way that someone who's five, someone who's 50, is, is still with it. Because to me, that is the thing that is ageless, is there is an inherently human thing in us. This is why the AIs will never uh, take over education. And it is because humans learn by watching other humans. We're just, we're animals. It doesn't matter. We're not computers. It doesn't matter. So like, there's something about watching and, and we're story, we're story oriented. So we're watching a character, we're watching another human being deal with a challenge or try to avoid a challenge, right? And make choices. And everybody understands that. Everybody understands that. Um, every human being understands that no matter what age they are. I, that, so for me, it just made my writing, I think, a little tighter and a little cleaner. And I was at a point in my playwriting career where I was trying to just really get technically tight. I was trying to like really just get my techniques down, like being able to bounce the ball or skip the stone. Shout out Sherry Kramer be able to skip the stone, um, you know, and I had little, you know, kinks in, in various parts of my stroke, so to speak. So like, you know, trying to better at endings, trying to like, you know, have more compelling middles, you know, um, blah, 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 you know, all that good stuff. So, um, but also the real, the real spill y'all is I was just, I was just trying to work. I was just trying to like make a name those years, those years, you know, um, I was just starting to, uh, I got on the tenure track at Colorado College. My son was born. You know, I was um, coming off of, you know, Humana Festival and stuff like that. I was just trying to really finally got an agent and was just trying to, like, get it going, get get those commissions, get my name out. So I was like, whatever, you know. Um, but I think just the TYA community um, embraced me. And again, at this time, I'm stepping into academia in a different way. So... Uh, it was all just like timing, but I tend to go where the heat is anyway. And uh, but I think it was always in me as well. So um, and then, yeah, I'll stop there. I promise. I promise shorter winded answers, y'all. And you all are not cutting me off enough. <laughs> we love everything that you're saying. So just keep talking. Also, this is about you. <laughs> well, TYA. Finally. And you. <laughs> 55 minutes of me. <laughs> Let's talk about my top five. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Um, well, when you, when you start writing a new TYA play, um, mm -hmm. are you, are you thinking about a specific age range that is a sweet spot for you or, you know, what is that, what is that beginning process for you? Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm going to give you a very super Libra answer here that, <laughs> that it's like, it's both and not at the same time. <laughs> um, you know, I am interested in being a master storyteller uh, across mediums. That is my personal professional goal. That is the legacy I wish to leave behind. Uh, it's just a gaggle of stories for everyone, for all human beings about what I thought it meant to be a human being um, in, you know, from 1977 to, to, when, to when the good Lord take me and I go take my long walk. Um, when I go to the upper room, anyway, sorry. Um, That's beautiful, be by the way. I just want to say that is beautiful. I'll be turning into grandma roof sometimes as I get older. Um, uh, so yeah, I think I just forgot the question. I'm sorry. No, I like, grandma roof there, took hold for a second. Are you thinking about a specific age range? You have oh yeah, 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 home, yeah, right? Right, like, right. Is your head well? I'm learning. Or? I mean, it's the, it's what it is. It's the nexus point, I think, of being a person, you know, being a, you know what I mean? Being a person in the world, being an artist who responds to what's inside and what's outside. Um, 
it's, you know, being in the industry, quote unquote, trying to make a buck or two, you know, what, what, what they buying. Right. So yes. Do I want to do my like bugged out alternate reality, (laughs) speculative civil war, vampire hunter, like, you know what I'm saying? You know, tech thriller, you know, for five-year-olds, of course. But uh, I also try to, I'm also trying to, I'm also trying to get, that produced and also, you know, get them royalties because them's nice. Um, so yeah, so it's a balance of, you know, and timing and what the things that are offered to you. And, you know, I've, I've, there have been books that I've been so wanting to adapt, right? Like I was, I was just, I came in the door for this job with, um, what's the old boys, Arnold Lobel's Owl at Home. And I was just I was like, I can see it. I've got such a great concept. We're going to do the dope. It's like Owl at Home. I already got the perfect, brilliant, like physical clown actor who will wear this, the world's greatest middle-aged owl costume. You know, it's going to be mad, you know, vision, you know, design silks for days. Give me, I want all the silk. Give me all the silk. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, and uh, I, the estate was just like, no, nah, Apple just bought Frog and Toad. So we, we strayed on that. We got to, we got to be <laughs> spending this Steve Jobs money. We don't need your little, we don't need your little TYA money, right? We gonna hang on to our owl. Thank you very much. Right. So, so sometimes, but then, you know, and then, uh, other titles, you know, but then some titles, uh, I literally, and somebody, this is a, a technique, by the way, you all who are listening to this, you can't see this, an author, literally just had a book mailed directly to me. Like it had my, she, she, wow. she mailed it. She from Amazon directly to my office, just like with a little note. That's like, this is my book. So you should, I'm like, <laughs> like, I don't know who you are. Adapt like, this, please, for the yeah, page? straight up. Oh, that's Real amazing. Spill. Real spill. That's amazing. And, um, so, you know, you know, and, and things have been offered to me that I just, I'm like, I don't know how to do, you know, novels are tricky. Novel, picture books are easier. Um, histories i've done a lot of like writing histories or folk tales but man novels why books are really tricky i uh, just did an adaptation of forgotten girl uh by india hill brown very dope story uh, but it was tricky because it's some you know novels novels are to me novels are the opposite of plays like for real like they in the fiction universe like they live in the same subdivision maybe um they were probably bitter rivals in high school but uh there's tons of respect Everyone thinks is the grass is greener on the other side, but there's no question that like the forms, the mediums are, are opposite. They're yin and yang, you know? So all that to say that, yes, Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever your question was. Yes. 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 <laughs> well, kind of adding on to Hannah's question, <clears throat> it's always thought of one people mainly think of TYA as like elementary students and because it's youth though, in Mm -hmm. general, uh, there always has to be a lesson You're Like there always has to be a moral. Yep. Do you start with that? Do you sit and think about, this is what I want to teach students, these particular things or this particular theme before even fully developing the story? Yeah. I start any, every play with a question that I'm interested in. Mm. Period. Um, Because I am uh, working in a tradition that is sacred uh, and working in a tradition and sort of have been empowered and anointed by my ancestors who were stolen Africans. And I'm here in North America and the songs and the stories and the lyrics and all that are our history, literally in our experience and must be handled with great care. You know, I don't, I I always need to have something to say that will be of use to the people coming behind me. And the youth are all coming behind me, all of them, right? Now, I have a very particular perspective, right, that I think is important for me to write from. And whenever I've deviated from that, the work has not been as strong or as rich. So for me, and I, but I think this is every artist working in any genre, it's like, what is this about? What is, how is this of use to the people coming behind you? How is this of use to humanity? Artists are servants 
right? We are, we are here to capture all the contradictions and the pains and the yearnings and the desires and the, and the remorse and all that good stuff. And it doesn't matter what age we are. We all feel that. We all feel it. We express it different. We understand it different, right? So for me, you know, I'm, I'm just also at a stage in my journey in my career where like I, it's so, there's so many things that are just, I'm so, I'm so in touch with, and I spend a great deal of time in reflection because who can listen to me all day? But um, <laughs> um, so I just think innately um, I'm sort of trained to uh, approach story from a question, like the thing of like someone is giving me their time. Someone is literally quote unquote paying attention. So what am I going to do with their, now that I have their attention, right? If somebody runs up to you on the street, says, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, ma'am, excuse me, excuse me. You're like, ugh, what, what, <laughs> right? <laughs> Get to it. I've stopped. I'm paying you my attention. Now what you, what you got for me, right? Yeah. It's an incredibly vulnerable position that's when someone is giving you their attention. You got to come with something, right? So young people, kids, what I love about them is they, they give you the best rewards if you earn it. Like, you know, so it's, it's, I, I always joke and say it's my drug of choice is the sound of lots of kids loving stories, loving theater. It's like, that is all I need to like clear all the clouds away. And it feeds me, you know? So I uh, don't know that I answered your question, but I feel like what I did say was at least not boring. And I yield the floor to the women of me. There, there were plenty of sound clips that I will have on replay. We're going to throw out there in the world. That was really great. Yeah, Good. for sure. Great. My question for you now is really about... Um, you know, I feel like we've talked about this before, but when you're handling complex ideas or heavy content, how do you approach that? What I appreciate about you as a writer, I'll first say, is that it doesn't seem like you shy away from this. And you are somebody who seems to believe that this is important for the youth to grapple with just like, you know, the adults. I think a my short answer is that's the job. Hmm. The job is not to pretend like, you know, I'm, I'm here to, I'm here to just, I'm here to reflect it. I'm here to think about, I'm here. It's like being, this is where like Idris the comedian comes in because it's just like, we all have saw what just happened, right? Like, now let's, you know, most people pack it away, right? The storyteller's job is to say, no, let's take this out. And we all saw what happened, right? Like, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, when when uh, there was that big race brawl on the riverfront and you saw people on social media went crazy. I have never, I mean, it's just like everyone was a comedian. There was so much funny stuff. And like, what's funny is like, you know, when I saw it, I was like, oh dear, like we've we've got so far still to go in our racial dialogue. Meanwhile, on the internet, they just, go, it's just like, everyone's just laughing about it. Right. Because, you know, and, and so that's just what we do. You know, that's what we do. It's like, you know, these tragedies, these terrible things are what it means to be alive. You know, it's, it's just what it means to be alive. And it's like, but you make a choice in how you're going to um, discuss it, not discuss it, treat it, regard it, you know? And I think what I'm saying, because this comedian in me is like comedy starts with a premise, what they call a premise, you know, and then you build the jokes from the, the premise. And so for me, that's what all these plays are. It's just like a premise um, under which I'm trying to explore. You know, I have I have a play about, um, I haven't started it yet. It's like sort of on the cork board, but, you know, about discipline, you know, discipline and punishment as, as an idea, as something that human beings do, but also through the lens of certainly the way I and a lot of Black folks uh, who grew up in America uh, who are from a certain tradition, we'll say, uh, we're disciplined, but not just us either, but definitely there's, there's a lot of material about it. <laughs> I'm like, if you want to interview me, you totally Their can. Their entire, <laughs> yeah, but this is one of the things, right? So it's like, um, when there was that, uh, you know, in the way that, that there was that documentary about black women's hair, good hair, right? Like 
it's like there are these conversations, there are these things, these internal dialogues, these, these things that we're not really talking about, but we all know about. So uh, so that's how I look at it. And like the kids all see it. They all know what's going on. Not obviously like, oh, this is a perfect example. Perfect example. So um, I'm not trying to put anybody on blast, but this is just the, for the purposes of education in this conversation. So I have this play called Parental Advisory that was uh, produced at Milwaukee Rep. And um, it's about censorship, about the history of censorship and the parental advisory sticker. and But more so, it's about this idea of this middle-aged father who's a hip-hop maker and a hip-hop fan trying to deal with and negotiate for himself, you know, really, like, how do we prepare and protect our kids for the, the, what's ugly and explicit in the world, right? Like, life is inherently explicit, and how do we protect ourselves, or can we, right? So that was the question of that play. Um, naturally, there's some profanity in the show. There's some uh, spicy language, we'll say, in the show, which was a choice that I made as well, right? Because I'm so used to being able to say the thing in a way that, you know, um, you know, kind of glides, you know, across whatever, right? But I'm like, no, this is, I want to write this in an authentic way to how I think and talk at 46 years old, right? Or 44 when I wrote it. Um, so anyway, there's a point, there's this running joke in the show about masturbation. And uh, and it's because, like, the, the genesis of the parental advisory sticker was um, Tipper Gore and all these other, um, you know, political women, uh, what, what, you know, many who were wives of senators or were, you know, politically active themselves, they got together because their daughters were listening to, like, Prince and Cindy Lauper and um, Sheena Easton, and all the songs were about masturbation. <laughs> and that's what they thought was obscene, right? And so the running joke of the show becomes, it wasn't like gangster rap or violence. It was just about something that people do, right? That is That hurts no one, right? Um, so it was a running joke. And so the, the actors, there was a show, a matinee for teenagers, um, and the actors were nervous and wanted to strike the line about masturbation. They didn't want to strike some of the other lines, but that, that line about masturbation uh, made them a little nervous. And I just thought that was so ironic because I'm like, this is a demographic that should be well-versed uh, on the subject matter. Uh, <laughs> I certainly was as a teenager. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, you know, I, I just think that it takes a little bit of courage, but I think young people appreciate it. That is the one thing I can say. I am not, I'm certainly not uh, consider myself uh, a master parent or anything like that, but I definitely, what I can say is that young people, kids, you know, I was a teaching artist for years, like they're ready for the world. You know, it's funny. It's like, they're ready for the world. They can't wait to jump in and as I get older, I'm just like, I just want to sit under a tree. Like, let me just get under this shady spot where no one can see me in this hammock. Like, you can have the world. I like, <laughs> you know, call me when there's some big stuff, but I'm chilling. Otherwise, you you go, you go, you go tussle with the world. And to me, that is what the storyteller is supposed to do is is help uh, the next generation process what is coming for them or what's ahead of them or what's in front of them. And and for me, end of the day, it's just about choices. I like to boil stuff down. I'm a long with the cat. So I like to use up the time with, with the right words. So um, for me, it's, it's about choices, modeling and showing them choices, right choices, wrong choices, and what comes with that. And really it's about like, why did this person make this choice? What choice would you make? So, you know, it's, it's, it's a testing ground, you know, it's the test stories are like the testing ground. As you were talking, you brought up good hair. Have you seen that movie Bad Hair? <laughs> the horror no, movie? No. Where like no. uh she ends up getting like this uh, you know, the hair crack and everything else, mm -hmm. and then the super tight weave in her hair, mm -hmm. and then she can't control her hair and it starts to like Genius. kill people and stuff. And I was like, oh, I understand. I'm jealous of whoever <laughs> came up with that. That is brilliant. That is absolutely genius. And it was like, what, 2020? I think it came out or 2021. And I was like, it took this mm -hmm. long to make this horror movie. I know. I know. <laughs> so there's that. And then there's like uh, what just came out, Wendell and Wild, this claymation Oh, movie. I haven't watched that yet. Is that? Yeah, I keep. Yeah. I, is it good? 
Yeah. And as you start watching it, you're like, oh my God, you're talking about, you realize that they're talking about private prison systems. For adults, it feels very weird because you're like, can you talk about this with children? Like, and they just do it and feed it to kids so well of like, this is why, like, this is what this means. I'm going to let you choose to see Mm -hmm. like why this is wrong. What does it mean? What are the consequences of this? And just laying it out where they can make their own choices and feel the way they do. And then also seeing kids following along what adults say just because they're adults. And then when they start making their own decisions, it might go against adults that are really important to you. And what does that mean? This, this, that's a great um, example because I think, I think the thing that I will say about writing for young people, and, and I think this just aligns with my preferences aesthetically. Um, they they want a little magic. They want some they want energy. They want energy. They want and and I say that very carefully because like some of these movies, it's just like everything's going on mile. It's not it's not that. You know, it's it's just some aspect of energy, fun, color, you know, they're they're a bit more sensory and they process that 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 stuff speaks to them in a you know, in a on a different level. That is the one thing I will say is you can talk about any subject, but I think you just got to, A, you got to just be, you know, some of this is just being a good, you know, just just being like a good storyteller. You know what I mean? It's just like understanding the balances and the levels, like, you know, less salt, more salt, more sweet, less sweet, you know, more bitter, less bitter, you know, it's just like mixing it together in a way that's compelling. So some of this is just being an art, it's just artistry. Some of this is just also, I think, um, Definitely story. Like, there has to be a story, period. Full stop, doesn't matter. There has to be something to, to carry them through. Um, choices, uh, but some some magic, which for any audience, I think that's what I want to always have. You know, for me to break beat plays, uh, which are not TYA plays, but for me, the magic in those plays is, is the music and the musicality and the and the, the techniques of hip hop, the way, you know, hip hop, you know, that's the magic of those plays for me, as opposed to like some of my historical plays or, you know, et cetera, et cetera, which um, writing less and less of those these days. So if just kind of going off of that, what would you boil down as like the biggest do's and don'ts uh, for writing for young audiences? Um, don't be boring. They got, they got it. They get it. Right. And when I say they get it, uh, I mean, have some courage. Like, don't, don't try to, you know, um, preach at them. Just tell the story mm. under a strong premise that's interesting to you. What do you want to leave behind for the people coming behind you? Uh, but also, it's like, don't, yeah, don't hold back. Don't be boring. Um, uh, and don't go over 75 minutes, I would say. <laughs> uh, yeah, and just write what you wanted to see. Write what you wanted to see when you were a kid. You know? What did you want to see when you were eight? What did you want to see when you were 12? What did you want to see when you were five? Okay, go write that. Don't write some whack, you know what I'm saying? I you love Mr. That. Rogers? You know what I mean? Like, just... Tell a story, fam. Like, are you are you trying to be their teacher or are you trying to be ASAP? Mm. Both are teachers. Don't get me, don't get it twisted, but like those are different things. You know, the guidance counselor, the coach, you know, all kids need all these people, right? <laughs> you need the deacon, you need the doctor, you need the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, you need everybody. But you are the storyteller. You are the entertainment. <laughs> you know. So uh yeah, but the fundamentals are the same. Honestly, it's just know how to tell a story. And I challenge, I challenge any, you know, they're in there, you know, shout out Karen Zacharias, shout out Larissa Fasor, shout out Alvaro Sarrios, shout out Jose Casas. I mean, we are in a beautiful time. There are so many dope people writing TYA, you know, Mabel Reynoso, like I could go on and on and on. Like we are in a beautiful time for this thing we do, this thing of ours, um, and people are really being innovative and interesting and exploding the form. And, and this is what I love, not just about being artistic director of Seattle Children's Theater, but also the president of TYA USA, which is a member serving organization that 
supports theaters and individuals um, who just basically consider and center and, 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 and see the value of, you know, f- uh, focusing their artistry on, on youth and their communities, um, or youth and their communities. Um, so uh, I've gone past the do's and don'ts <laughs> and I've just gone into the plugs, I guess. We love good plugs. Yeah. We love those. We'll ask you for more as we go along. So Right on. Um, is there a difference, do you think, between writing plays for young audiences and writing plays for, let's call them adults? Um, I mean, you know, I want to give you like some pretentious artist answer, but like, you know, let's, let's get it, let's get down to it. I mean, plays are functional, they're sheet music and you, you want to hear them played. Right. So it's like, come on, like grow up. Like you're not going to, you know, you got to know like what notes are going to work in that music hall and what aren't. Right. So it's like, know your venue. Okay. Like just know your venue. And that's part of the work, right? You're, if you're tailoring a beautiful, you know, double breasted suit, you got to take some measurements first of the human you're going to put it on. Right. Yeah. But I also, I, I appreciated what you said too earlier about writing the story that you want to write. Yeah. Because sometimes I think that's where maybe things don't go well. You're like, I'm imagining this kid and I'm writing for them, but you don't, you don't have that like hook because you don't believe it as much. Yeah. Well, and, and just to, just to like refine, you know, and, and, and repeat that statement too. I think it's, it's write the play that you would have wanted to see when you were that age. Yeah. 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 As opposed to, this is a, so shout out, uh, the, the the writer Dave Pilkey, who is the author of Captain Underpants and uh, <laughs> Dog the Dogman series, um, and I remember my son when he started. I would hear him laughing and chuckling, in his, you know, when he was like in third grade and third or fourth grade. And I I would like, what are you reading? You know, and he just was into these books, Dogman, and he was just he would just walk up to me holding the book, shaking his head like that. You gotta see, come on. It's, I mean, right? And he'd like look over my shoulder as I'm reading and be like, right, right? It's hilarious, right? And I'm like, what? What is going on? This is like, you know, there's nothing going. This is pee pee poo poo stuff, right? All right, whatever. And then I I realized that the brilliance of that book is it's it, the device of it is it's it's a it's a he creates these characters, these fifth graders who are writing a series called Dogman. So he sets up this frame of these are kids writing for younger kids, right? So, of course, my 40 plus year old ass, you know, my 40 plus year old ass, I look at it and I'm like, what? Oh, my gosh. Because he, these kids are not writing for someone like me. They're writing to my son. And he it hits a different to him. And I think the difference is that when you're in your when you're an adult, you, again you're trying to there's there's the responsibility, and I don't think that's a bad thing, right? But I think it hits different when you're when it's kids hearing other kids, right? And you know, for me, it's it's um that's the fun of it is that you got to go on a you you know you if you were writing for your age and older or not even for them, but just that's who you're thinking about. That's the preset of the expectation. Versus, you know, it forces you as a writer to consider other experiences, which I think just makes you like a better artist, Mm. right? Is that you you have to actually watch young people. I took my son and his homeboy out for pizza on Saturday, and I was just sitting there just watching them. You know what I'm saying? They're 11. I don't remember what it was like to be 11. And I'm just watching them. And I'm just watching what they're talking about. You want to know what we talked about? You want to know what the big hot subject was amongst these 11-year-old boys? I definitely do. Planes, planes, like, and strength, and like, but like ridiculous, like planes that are abnormal, like super large, and like we said, I brought. I was like, hey, have either of you guys heard about the spruce goose? And and my son's friend knew what that was. He knew the real name. The spruce goose was what the journalist called it, trying to make fun of of Howard Hughes. But he knew the like the, the Hercules. It was no, it's called the Hercules Five or whatever, right? And he taught me what a fuselage was. I, I'm walking around thinking a fuselage is a whole different part of the plane. This 11 year old boy knew it, so I would not have predicted that. I would have been like, "What y'all talking about? The TikTok? What y'all talking about? What y'all talking about? Y'all talking about Captain America? Or somebody? You know? They no, they talking about the Spruce Goose." <laughs> 
That's what's popping in the streets right now. Yeah. <laughs> Aviation. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a thrill and an honor and it gives, it, it reward, it gives me great rewards. Um, so I guess that would be really my advice, man. It's like folk, just like, don't overthink it. Like go to libraries, like read what they read, picture books, read YA books. Right. Because those writers, they understand that it's, it's, it's just, they want it. The story's just got to move. It's just got to have a pace that's consistent. It's got to be fast. They'll sit with you. And it's also okay. They're not going to understand everything. Don't worry about them understanding everything. You come back to it. You know what I'm saying? Goodfellas. Goodfellas has been my favorite movie since Goodfellas was new. I've come back to Goodfellas has remained the same. I've come back to it different over the years. And I like it for different reasons, but it's also like a song, Mm. you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a piece of music. And so it's like, you come back to songs that, you know, uh, Stevie Wonder hit a certain way in 1984 at the family reunion and it hits different now in 2023, but the song is the same. And that's how I feel about these stories. So my advice is like, just, just, just like hang out with kids, watch kids, read what they're reading. If you really want to do it right. And humble yourself a bit, you know, humble yourself to uh, the fact that like you were, you were, you were doing something that is really important and noble and has a different layer to it. I'll tell one last quick story. Muhammad, the the Muhammad Ali play I spoke about and in this corner, Cassius Clay, which was uh, commissioned by Stage One Family Theater in Louisville, Kentucky, which is where Muhammad Ali grew up. Um, and the story, most people don't know this, is that uh, Muhammad Ali was introduced to boxing at age 12 when someone stole his bicycle and he was very pissed. And he was like, when I catch this thief, I'm going to beat this kid up. And the policeman that he was talking to was like, do you even know how to fight? You should come learn to box. Because that's what, back in the day, that's what they would do. They would kind of, like, boxing was the thing. And that's what they would, you know, kids on the street and stuff. And it was cops. It was these white cops who created, there was a, it was a cop named Joe, 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 Mor- Joe Morgan, Joe Morton. Dang, it's been a while, y'all. Joe Martin, Joe Martin. Whew. I'm like, man, it's happening. Um, So Joe Martin... Uh, so this white cop invites young Cassius, then Cassius Clay, to the Columbia gym, which is where all the cops worked out to get into a ring and learn to fight. Um, so flash forward, the show then goes to St. Louis, Missouri, to Metro Theater Company. Shout out Julia Flood. Shout out um, Jacqueline Thompson as well. Um, and this is right in the height of Mike Brown and Ferguson, et cetera. And so in the post show, uh, you know, we were asking, talking to the kids about the play in that moment where young Muhammad Ali goes up to the white police officer, all worked up, you know, it, it hit different for them, mm-hmm. you know, and it really opened up some great conversations about, wow, this is the 50s. Um, this is Kentucky, which was Kentucky is a very interesting state in the sense that it was like kind of neutral, you know, when it was all going down. It's like kind of the Midwest, kind of the South. Um, interesting story there. The director of uh, Birth of a Nation is from there, from uh, Kentucky. Anyway, it goes on and on. Uh, but still, this white police officer um, regarded this young, worked-up Black boy, you know, a certain way and helped, invited this young Black boy to learn to fight. Mm. Um, and so here we are in 2015, it was at the time. You know, is that... Can we still say the same thing? What's changed? What hasn't changed? Right. Mm-hmm. And so that moment was another big one for me about, you know, what they see and what they're processing and, and theater's role in supporting that process. Yeah. Wow. That's intense. Well, now the time has come for us to ask one of our favorite questions. And it doesn't have to be your life philosophy. It can just be for right now in this moment. Where does theater begin for you? Uh, theater begins for me with a question. I always start with with a question, something I'm wondering about, and then there's a moment where I'm one. I, I'm like, I cannot be the only one who's pondering this question, um, and I would prefer to explore the answer of that through art uh, and engage other people in that conversation. Uh, you know, theater for me is a dialogue, uh, and as a playwright, you're 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 doing the, you're in the call part, you're starting the conversation, uh, but you don't have to 
finish it. Mm. Yeah, that's beautiful. All right. Today, theater begins when your humble goal is to leave a gaggle of stories behind on your experience of being human for those that are coming behind you to understand and learn from and do the same all under 75 minutes. Yes. (laughs) 75 minutes. Yeah, that's exactly it. Well, um, so from this conversation today, I took this away that theater begins with modeling choices, which is the job of the storyteller and um, that stories are the testing ground. So thank you, Idris, for being with us. This was a great, great conversation. Yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure, y'all. It's great to see you both. This was really fun. I I got really lost in it. Thank you. This was um, really good to get to reflect on this stuff, y'all. Appreciate you. Join us for our next episode on January 31st. Let us know on Spotify where theater begins for you. Feel free to send your questions for future episodes to the link in the bio. Thanks for listening to Playwright Center's Theater Begins Here.